the country of India, the first official Seventh-day Adventist missionary and mission on the mightiest river system in the world, coming up next. Hello, I'm Gary Krauss and welcome to Mission 360, coming to you today from Manaus, Brazil. Manaus is a large city and it's the gateway to the Amazon. But when you're in the middle of the city, surrounded by tall buildings, you don't realize that how isolated this city is. It's surrounded by jungle. In fact, the only way to get here is either by plane or by boat, or if you are adventurous, by four-wheel drive. This is actually the Negro River, and a, a bit further upriver, it joins with the Solomoids River, and those convergence of waters are very photographed because you see the actual colors change in the water. And then they become the Amazon River, the mighty Amazon River. And on today's program, we will look at the first, or well, one of the first pioneer missionaries who braved the waters of the Amazon. But first up, we're going to meet the first Seventh-day Adventist missionary ever sent, and it was to the country of Switzerland. William Ambrose Spicer wasn't born Seventh-day Adventist, but he converted around 14 years old after attending revival meetings and reading the great controversy. When he was only 16, he had to drop out of high school to care for his father, who had recently endured a stroke. Spicer needed a job, and he found one at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Young William worked all day and took secretarial courses by night. At 22, he moved to England when former conference president Stephen Haskell offered him a job. Haskell was a missionary to England. But interestingly, England was sending navies, merchants, scientists, and others to the far reaches of Africa and India. Around the world, Western colonialism was spreading. Powerful countries were driven by economic and political gain ethnocentric beliefs about race superiority, and the thrill of exploration. The motivation to colonize distant lands even got mixed up with religion. And though the reasons for missions were muddied by some, it's undeniable that colonialism helped lay the groundwork for honest, Christ-centered missionaries to reach out in love. At this point, Seventh-day Adventist Missions was like a base jumper at the edge of a precipice. So much potential, ready at any second, like a toddler learning to walk, like a handful of lycopodium powder sitting next to a candle, waiting to get shaken up, primed to ignite. And William Spicer was the breeze to do it. The Spicer wind began to blow in 1892 when he was named secretary of the newly minted Foreign Missions Board. Only one year later, an African prime minister donated 12,000 acres of farmland to the Adventist church. This allowed Spicer to establish the Salusi Mission in Zimbabwe, the first of hundreds of African missions. In 1898, Spicer received two notices. The first calls for a missionary to Africa, the second to India. After prayer and a family meeting, Spicer accepts the call to India. He becomes a missionary and editor of the first American periodical in India. Oriental Watchman. But Spicer didn't erupt into a gale force until after he returned to the United States several years later. He would serve A.G. Daniels as secretary during Daniels' term as conference president. And then Daniels would return the favor when Spicer became president. Together, these two led the church for the first 30 years of the 20th century. And they would do for Adventist missions what Henry Ford did for the automobile industry. Ford was visiting a meatpacking plant when he realized that all the workers stood still while the product came to them. Why not do the same for cars? Suddenly, the industrial assembly line was born. Infrastructure. Groundwork. Around the turn of the century, it became clear that the church's top-down style of government was failing. While appropriate to a small, localized church, this method ceased to be effective as the church stretched across continents and oceans. A.G. Daniels suggested union conferences handing the responsibilities to locals on the ground, familiar with the specific needs of that region. 
During the reign of Western imperialism, leaders like Teddy Roosevelt employed battleship diplomacy. In the midst of a nonviolent conflict, one country's naval fleet would show up on the other's shores, posturing all its power. This showmanship was usually enough to resolve the issue in favor of the team with the biggest guns. This mindset infected foreign missions too, and Spicer knew it. He raised the issue of American nationalism saying, it does one no good to take along from America a national feeling into the field. Missionaries had too often erected a barrier between himself and every soul who is not an American. William Spicer wrote at least eight books and never owned a car. He always traveled coach on trains and he wouldn't buy anything he couldn't pay for in cash. Our Adventist College in India is named for him. Before Spicer in 1880, the church had eight overseas missions. In 1890, still only eight, but by 1900, there were 42. Then 87 in 1910. 153 in 1920, and in 1930, 270 missions in over 50 countries. That's three Adventist foreign missionaries for every one employed stateside. Spicer stirred the air and the lycopodium powder exploded into flames. The church's membership was growing as numerous as the stars. I'm delighted to be able to talk to Herbert Kalbermatter, who is the regional director for the Adventist Development and Relief Agency here in the Amazon region. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm very interested to hear that the Lazero boat is still operating on the Amazon River. Can you tell some of the history of the Lazero boat? The history of the first Lazero boat begins with the arrival of a pioneering family of missionaries. They were Leo and Jesse Halliwell. After deciding to design and build the first Lazero boat, on 4th of July, 1931, the Halliwells launch it, and now they begin to cruise the Amazon River. They encounter many obstacles and challenges as they navigate through the Amazon, but they were highly motivated and enthusiastic about this work. They traveled from village to village, serving the people in a unique way through the health ministry. This, of course, transformed lives. Since then, because of the Halliwell's example, we also feel motivated to do the same work. Today I have the privilege of directing this legacy service that began some 85 years ago. In essence, we do here the very work that they began with a lot of challenges back then. We continue to work with the countless communities along the Amazon River, serving the people through health and healing. This is how this important ministry began here in the Amazon region. So today the, the tradition continues and the Lazero boat travels doing what? Today we work from three operational centers. We have stationed nurses on each of them to provide emergency assistance. We have also developed partnerships with other institutions. And much like in the past, the modern Lazero boats visit the villages, bringing healing and attending the sick. Many professionals come from all parts of the world. They also come from nearby schools and hospitals. Through the volunteer service of these professionals, we navigate to the riverside communities, arriving at the people's front door to offer them what they need the most. If these doctors and nurses did not come, the people here would have to brave the river waters for some eight hours by boat, navigating before they could receive any medical attention. The locals view these people who come to serve as the white angels. Now, the Lazero boat has touched the lives of thousands of people. Can you give an example of someone who has been helped through this, through this work? You are right. The Luzero boat continues to bring health and healing. Recently, we met a child who had been bitten by a snake. It was a venomous snake, known as the pit viper or the bushmaster. This child's family took their small boat and traveled for five hours to reach our operational center. We were in the middle of another delicate appointment when we met this family. They explained to us what had happened, and as we examined the boy, we realized how serious his condition was. 
so we quickly hopped on one of our smaller and faster boats and rushed him to the hospital. We were very concerned, and all the way into town, we prayed for the boy. Honestly, we did not expect that he would survive. But God worked a beautiful miracle. We arrived at the hospital some eight hours later after he was bitten. It was very late at night, but the hospital staff cared for the boy, and a week later he was released. He returned with marks on his foot, but he was still alive. Experiences like this one show us how important this work is, a work that is saving and transforming lives in the communities along the Amazon River. How long have you worked for ADRA? I have worked for 10 years now, actually 12 years, two as a volunteer and 10 years working full-time. And I must say, it's a great joy working for ADRA. So, so why, why do you work for ADRA? Why, why is it an important work for you? ADRA gives us the privilege of working as the arms and hands of Jesus. We help people who are needy and who are hopeless. And through our actions, we can show love to these people in practical ways. When we assist people, we fulfill many of the verses in the Bible, verses that encourage us to help others, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick. And through the Luzero work, we continue to touch people where they have the greatest need. It is our greatest privilege and honor to serve the people. We want to thank Leo and Jesse Halliwell for navigating the Amazon River, for visiting people and transforming lives. Abrogado, thank you so much for sharing with us. And we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Manaus. Next up, we travel to Rwanda, where Gina Walleen hears a remarkable story from a genocide survivor. Today, we are on the beautiful campus of the Adventist University of Central Africa in Rwanda. And I am talking with Dr. Fodilis, who is a professor in the theology department. Now, doctor, today, as we look around here on campus and across Rwanda, it's beautiful, it's peaceful, but as we know, it has not always been that way. During the genocide, you were here. Could you tell us what it was like during that time? Well, it is very difficult actually to express exactly what happened during that time. It was bad, where you see thousands and thousands of people being killed in the churches, in the stadium. More than a million of people were killed in only a hundred days. One million people in only 100 days. Now, during that time, did you lose any family members? Yeah, of course. I, we were about eight children in my family, and parents, and six of them were killed. And all of them had children, and even grandchildren. Uh, I mean, we had grandchildren in my family, and all of them we were about 34 from my mother's. Uh, family. All of them killed, were killed. All of them. And even you, I understand, faced death many times. And in fact, in your story, there's a point where you are digging your own grave. Can you tell us what that was like? What was happening? What was going through your mind? Well, it is very hard to express, but God is so good. When you know him, he gives you the courage to face even moments like that. So when I was caught in a bush, it was around 11 a.m., and they asked me to go and dig the grave because they said, you look strong, you don't, we don't dig the grave for you. You better dig, then we kill you after. And so I, dis I, I was going to dig. There was no other choice. I dug, I started digging. But at the same time, I was praying. I was saying, Lord, I know you are able to help me. And I said, uh, you know, I had started preaching at the age of maybe 20. 
and I was a church elder in one of the biggest churches here in Kigali called Remera. And so I said, Lord, I've preached about Daniel. I've preached about Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And I know you can do the same today. You can save my life. And so I prayed and, and the Lord answered my prayer. Now, well, it's a long story, but I was saying, Lord, you save me. You give me wings. I'll fly from this place. But there were no wings. And I prayed for the fire to come or the thunder so that people would just be scattered. But there was no thunder. But God has his own ways of answering prayers and he answered my prayer. I thank the Lord for that. How did he answer your prayer? Well, one of the killers had my Bible. Uh, the Bible I had, wherever I was, I used it as a pillow. I, I, I put it into a plastic bag and a bush. I could read it every day. And so I, uh, one of the killers had it just on the top of the, 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 the grave. And he was reading. And interestingly, he was only looking at uh, the highlighted verses. And, and so as he read, he, he was asking me, he said, why are these places different from others? Why are they highlighted, underlined? I said, these are my favorite passages. And he couldn't understand. He kept reading. He read those verses, underlined verses. And later on, he said, could you please give me this Bible before you die? I said, go ahead and take it. But he said, others couldn't allow it. He said, no, that is not his Bible. It is our Bible. You will pay it if you want to get it. And so he said, no matter how much money you need, I'll pay it. He obviously he had been touched by the word of God. And later on, it is a long story, but uh, later on, the very man, as he continued reading, he was somehow touched and he said he, to the, his colleagues, militia, he said, could you please allow me to help him digging the grave? And he dug the grave for me. But I was... I wasn't comfortable with that because I was scared. I said, the grave is finishing and they are just going to bury me, to kill me. And so I prayed and prayed, and, but God answered the prayer in a different way. And so, uh, well, they, buried, they used that grave to bury somebody else. They said, no, we're not going to use it to bury this strange man. We are burying someone else we know from this village because I was of a different village. And uh, they, they, they said a prayer which actually I wasn't comfortable with. Because they, they were saying, Mary, mother of Jesus, receive him. And, and it was ironically. So I felt I have to say something as an Adventist. And I said, these people have never been instructed. They have never known God. I must tell them who God is and, and, and what is the truth about the dead. So that they themselves don't expect to be prayed for once they are dead. And so I said, Lord, please don't allow me to fly away. Don't walk out any miracle before I said something to these people. I preached to them by God's grace and, and they repented and they went even hiding me for about two days. They gave me their food and, and so on. It's a beautiful testimony you have, Doctor. Just in closing, what would you say to a person who may be watching this right now who has experienced trauma or something very difficult in their lives and they're having a hard time forgiving those who have hurt them? What would you say to that person? It is beautiful to know Jesus and it is really good because when you know Jesus, you won't just get traumatized. I know what I'm saying. There are people who may not understand exactly what I'm saying. But when you have had a personal experience with Jesus, he makes you busy with him. Even when you have gone through all that, because having lost everyone at a very young age and not knowing, because I was thinking, if I go to school, what is it going to be for? If I, I get a better life, who is going to say that? All these questions were coming to mind. But again, I was busy. As I said, I was a church elder at the age of 24, and I was preaching everywhere, conducting evangelistic campaigns, and, and I felt I found myself taking care of others and, and caring for others, praying for them. And I felt there was no room for me to, to, to feel like I was desperate. God is so good. Actually, in fact, I felt I had to respond to other people's problems and needs and, and up to now the Lord has blessed. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, Thank Doctor. you so much, too. Thank you. Very inspiring. Next up, we continue our journey back through time as we look at the mission history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first thing you think of when I say NASA is probably the moon landing. It was truly incredible. Only 12 people in history have ever bounced across the lunar surface. But as impressive as that is, NASA has its sights set on loftier goals, Mars. And if putting a human on the moon was hard, putting one on Mars is crazy. The history of reaching the red planet reads something like this. Spacecraft did not reach Earth orbit. Spacecraft's radio failed. Spacecraft at the top of the rocket failed to jettison. Orbiter failed during launch. Orbiter flew past the planet. Lander failed due to fast impact. Flyby module and lander arrived, but lander missed the planet. Is this picture clear? Just getting to Mars is problematic. Earth and Mars orbit the sun at different speeds. That means the two planets are constantly drifting apart or getting closer together. If they launch when Mars is close, the trip could take as little as six months. If they launch when Mars is furthest away, add a year to the travel time. And if they miss, it's not like they can set up another rocket to try again right away. The cycle between launch opportunities is close to a year and a half. The journey itself is arduous. The living space is cramped. Bathing with water is impossible. Showers happen with moist towelettes. All food must be canned or freeze-dried. Microgravity deteriorates muscle and bone. And if a solar storm hits, astronauts must retreat to even tinier protected areas of the craft. Assuming launch, flight, and landing are successful, all Mars astronauts will also become farmers on a freezing, oxygenless planet. They will plant, cultivate, harvest, cook, and compost indoors to have food rations. They must continue a self-sustaining existence for somewhere in the ballpark of two and a half years. That's the minimum amount of time they'll spend all alone, removed from their friends and family before they can come back. And why? Because they believe it's important. Important enough to take the risk, to make the sacrifice. When I say steamship, you probably think of the Titanic. And you are either thinking of a very terrible tragedy or a very long movie. Either way, passengers tell us that the only thing worse than swimming for your life from a sinking steamship is having to live on board one. On Christmas Eve 1901, Jacob Nelson Anderson led the first three commissioned Adventist missionaries to China. With their four-year-old son, Stanley, they left their home in Wisconsin and traveled by train to San Francisco. From there, they boarded a steamship bound for Hong Kong. This was 10 years before anyone would dare to claim a steamship could be unsinkable. At the time, everyone carried living memory of tragedies like the Independence, which crashed into a reef off the Northern California coast, losing 150 passengers and crew. If our missionaries traveled in the steerage deck, then they were packed in like cattle with the cargo. When the miserable food was dealt out of huge kettles into dinner pails, the strong would shove and bully. Two to four hundred people might sleep in the same room on bunks. Privacy was impossible. Available restrooms often equated to pots and pans. Unsanitary conditions frequently led to death. Did you catch that? Just being on a steamship could kill you. No icebergs necessary. And the trip takes a minimum of three weeks. Upon arrival, J.N. Anderson's escort failed to meet the missionary team. Stranded and exhausted, they immediately realized yet another challenge, communication. Mandarin doesn't use the Western alphabet, but unique characters for every word. Its grammar doesn't come from verb tenses, but from tonal inflection. Standing there with bags in hand, our missionaries probably felt a lot like astronauts setting foot on Mars but they believed the work was important enough to take the risk, to make the sacrifice. J.N. Anderson's diary records him as a man with a rich heart for the land and its people. He and the others were committed. The first task was to learn the language. It took two years. 
the next task was getting from Hong Kong to mainland China. This only proved possible because of the efforts of other missionaries, both official and unofficial. J.N. Anderson met his neighbors, shopped at local markets, and shared his faith. On Valentine's Day, 1903, Anderson baptized six Chinese converts to Adventism. That's how the church started in China, six people. Anderson's appeals to the General Conference scored four doctors and two nurses, the beginning of Adventist medical missionary work in China. A Chinese church headquarters were established. Anderson's sister-in-law formed the first Adventist school. Anderson's younger brother was so inspired that he made the steamship journey out and joined the efforts. In the spring of 1906, J.N. Anderson passed the torch to Nga Pit Ke, ordaining him as the first Chinese minister in the SDA church. This one action opened the door for dozens of other Chinese church members to join in, spreading the good news. Today, in China, there are over 400,000 Adventist believers in 4,571 congregations. Well, thanks for joining us on today's program. I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by what you've seen and heard about mission around the world. You know, in Europe, in Africa, right here in Brazil, there are still many mission challenges. There, there seem to be many obstacles, but there are still many opportunities. And I want to thank you for your continuing prayerful and financial support for mission. It does make a difference. And around the world, global mission pioneers are planting churches and it's so encouraging for them to know that there is a world church praying for them. Before we go, I'd like to give you a special offer. It's actually a book that I wrote some years ago called God's Great Missionaries. And it's full of stories, not only of Bible missionaries, but also people today who are putting Christ's love into action around the world. Thanks so much for joining us today for Adventist Mission. I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope you can join us next time right here on Mission 360.